So today we talk about more cross take on causal loop diagrams and this general idea of this feedback system thinking and what they mean by feedback system thinking, what might be the value of that. I think the chapter started talking about the way a lot of decision makers think is in this event oriented model. And in the events oriented model, they talk about you just respond to problems as they occur with a local solution. And so this is a figure they got out of the chapter. They said we have a goal and a situation that generates some discrepancy. So we take some immediate action through this decision, and then hopefully those results end up solving this uh, discrepancy. And so the potential issue here is we might not be thinking of the downstream effects of whatever this action is and whether in the long term if we actually end up uh, solving the main problem. So the thought here is that the problem arrives from outside of the system and so we, our solution is to patch that particular problem. This is kind of like an innate immune system response. You get a wound, you recruit uh, something to uh, heal the wound, the wound heals and everything's fine. <clears throat> This is the exogenous worldview. It's to solve problems that are best modeled <clears throat> as events that occur that come from outside that you have to come up with a solution, but it's a one-time solution and it, you don't necessarily have to worry about these problems reoccurring due to some internal process. So they have examples here of if you have unruly binge drinkers, maybe you deploy more police. If you've got a lot of drug-related crime, maybe you deploy more police. Maybe if you've got congestion, we'll just build new roads and that will resolve the congestion. Loss of market share, well, put out a new product and you'll get more market share. Uh, decline of fishing in the community, well, build a new uh, fish factory and people will work there and uh, that will um, increase the fishing community again. These are all kind of short-term fixes which may or may not work. Uh, most likely they're going to work more in systems where really the problem truly does arise from outside the system. But the threat here is that maybe the problem is more internal. And so if we take this approach as opposed to this endogenous approach we've been talking about, we might be overlooking something. So this is also referred to then as this open loop view. It's this assumption that our system is just lives here and the problems arrive at it. But if you include the solution to the problem, the problem itself as part of a larger system, you close the loop. And so when you're not doing that, then this view is called the open loop view. The potential feedback from the solution to problem is ignored. So we'll, we'll use those phrases kind of interchangeably, this event oriented or open loop perspective. So uh, the open loop view in this kind of this diagram here is that if the potential feedback from solution to problem is ignored, that's like saying that, uh, well, you know, if you, uh, this in this cartoon depicts here, if you've got this wall next to you, you can push down this wall thinking that maybe you've solved your problem, not realizing that behind the scenes, you've end up setting a process in motion that will end up doing exactly the opposite as what you want it to. So you thought you were opening up space for you, but in the end, you might, uh, your demise might be coming. So uh, due to your particular action. So that's what we're trying to sort of expand so that we can think of models where this feedback oriented perspective might be useful. So their example was this congestion example uh, modeling, I think, uh, the roadways in London, but this could be about anywhere. And the thought was there is this complicated system, but most people don't think about this system. They think more locally. So they say, hey, there is a pressure to reduce congestion, so why don't we build more roads? I think we've all seen this. It seems like there's certain highways that are always under construction or certain cities that always have a road that is under construction. And that kind of... Uh, doesn't give you this, uh, they don't, uh, there's a road construction effect that may someday then feed back on this pressure to reduce congestion. So simply building more roads might only be a short term fix. So the simplistic view would just think, well, all right, well, if I think this through, then the pressure to reduce congestion might then uh, lead to road construction, which leads to increased highway capacity, which then leads to decreased travel time, which then, increases the pressure to reduce congestion. So here in this 
simplistic feedback uh, related view, we at least capture this idea that maybe building more roads is not going to solve the problem in the long term because after some delay, people will get used to the decreased travel time. And uh, if you um, and if you have the decreased tra travel time, then well, actually, that's not the second part down here. So this is our view here that even if we increase the capacity, uh, highway capacity, we're going to decrease travel time. If we decrease travel time, we will um, uh, increase the pressure to reduce. Um, I think I got that backwards here. If we decrease travel time, we will decrease the pressure to reduce congestion. So this is what we think is happening. We build roads, which will end up decreasing travel time, which will then reduce the pressure to build more roads, and roads will eventually stop being built. So this is what we hope is happening, a balancing feedback loop where whenever you have congestion, you build roads. When you build roads, it makes things more spacious. When it makes things more spacious, then people get there in time. When they get there in time, they don't want you to build more roads, and road construction stops. This, although it's got a feedback loop, this is very much like, again, the problem comes from outside. For some weird reason, we uh, had roads that were under capacity. For some weird reason, we have a cut, and we need to heal that cut. So this idea here is that maybe this will form a scab, which will eventually heal that cut, and, uh, and everything will be on its way. But it's avoiding this, this, this question of why was there the initial problem with our highway capacity? Did we just plan poorly to begin with? Or are there other things at, at going on? And that's why Moorcroft tried to then expand this out and say, well, if you think about it, if you decrease the travel time, you're going to make uh, attract driving more attractive. And if you make driving more attractive, people are going to increase their trips per day. And if they increase their trips per day, they're going to increase traffic volume. And if traffic volume increases, then travel time is also going to increase. So although you have a balancing feedback loop, which suggests it's going to bring things back into check, it's going to bring the highway capacity to a higher amount, and by doing so, it's going to reduce the pressure to, um, to, for, to get rid of congestion, and it's going to stop the road construction. But if you then say, well, there's another balancing loop here, then what we see is that in this balancing loop, decreasing travel time increases how much traffic you have on the roads. So people just fill this highway capacity up. So in the end, the travel time might end up being just as bad as it always was, but now you've had to live through more road construction and uh, you end up not really being in a better place. So you just make the roads bigger, but then people just drive more. So this is this two balancing loops coupled. Does anybody remember when I first introduced like causal loops diagrams? I, I had another system where I had two systems I presented where you had two balancing loops coupled together. And, and so and what, what were some of those examples that I gave? Was one of them was like in the winter this happens? It's a system we'd be modeling that, you know, could be often, yes. The heating system. The heating system, right? This very much is like the heating system example where you've got uh, this, you've got our desire to keep a house at a particular temperature, but you've also got the thermodynamic uh, truth that if you keep the house above the temperature of the outside temperature, you're going to get leakage out of the house. So you've got two balancing loops. You've got uh, the nature is trying to keep your house at the same temperature as outside, and you're trying to keep your house at whatever temperature you'd like it to be in. And these two balancing loops fight each other. They end up coming to some equilibrium in the middle, that's the temperature your house is at, but it is at the cost of this one thing out on the edge always increasing, and this other thing out on the edge always increasing. So if this is the way that your policy works, then this runs the risk of having road construction forever and having people constantly increasing the number of trips per day, but ultimately the travel time, the enjoyment that you get out of each one of those trips doesn't actually get any better. So it's and, and one of these examples, if we look at loops combined together, we end up seeing commonalities in the dynamical behavior. But Moorcroft points out that it gets even worse and that, so this is that reinforcing, that escalation motif that I was talking about. And so we're going to get, uh, I'll give you a separate reading that comes up. I think it's our next reading 
and where we go through the common motifs for the, oh, how all these loops uh, come together. And this is one of those common motifs where you have two balancing loops coupled by this little bow tie in the middle where this thing appears to be regulated, but it's at the cost of having an engine where this is constantly growing and this is constantly growing or escalating. And so that's an example of this, but um, escalation. So that's gonna come in unit C, that's our next reading. But Moorcroft even expands that out and says, well really there's a whole bunch of these balancing loops that <clears throat> if you wanted to get rid of this escalation behavior, maybe you could find a way to interrupt one of these loops. But it turns out that there's a bunch of these that are going on in parallel. So if you make driving less attractive, uh, or then uh, if you make driving less attractive, then more people will take the bus, and maybe that's a good thing. But by decreasing travel time, you might make driving more attractive, which means that people take the bus less. So you actually can, before you had a lot of people doing public transit, but now that they can drive the car because there's increase, increased capacity, there's less public transit, and so, uh, so that you know, puts more cars, more traffic there, and so on and so forth. And so there are a wide variety of these things, and if you keep attacking one, there's another one that can fill in. And in the end, if this is your main loop for highway construction, it's always gonna be fighting against at least one of these balancing loops leading to an escalation behavior. So when we zoom out and find the escalation behavior, it suggests to us that maybe this solution up here, this simple band-aid really that we're putting on here, our attempt at a scab to, to stop the gushing blood coming out of this wound that is our infrastructure system is maybe a good short-term fix, but in the end, we've got to stop the thing that's causing that wound, which is the psychology of people driving down here. So maybe if we made, for example, the attractiveness of public transport, you know, uh, more, if we made it more attractive, then maybe um, that would be a different, a better intervention strategy, or something addressing some of these variables and not just something like that. So that was kind of what I think Moorcroft was trying to get out. Any questions? So can any of the three bottoms of the C be escalated back to the top, or is it just addressing all these other F? So that's a good question. Is that so? This escalation motif I could have drawn if I were to erase the rest, some of these links. As long as I had a balancing loop left over in the bottom, then that could play the role of that kind of other. You know, you've got these two things trying to balance, but they're mutually keeping themselves out of balance. That's right, this escalation motif, that's the only one I'm sort of focusing on here. But we've seen like um, a feedback with delay, that creates certain common patterns. Um, then when uh, you guys are doing the, the assignments that is due on Sunday, you'll see another way that two loops are linked together where they won't necessarily be two balancing loops, but there were two other types of loops, and it turns out that has a name as well. So, once we start zooming out and stop looking at the variables and start looking at the way loops interact, then we have a better way to predict behaviors. All right, so any questions about that traffic example? Or maybe a disagreement, or is it still an oversimplification? What do you mean by that? And so there are definitely loops here that are links that are not, I mean, you're right, this, this is sort of modeling one particular system where somebody has implemented this top loop and has identified things in this bottom loop that were going on. But if you could go and bulldoze everything and restart over, you might have a very different way. You might charge people to drive on the highway. 
And the fact that you charge people to drive on the highway may be an alternative way, like toll roads, to deal with this problem. If you want to propose an intervention, like you're, you're sort of saying here, there are economic reasons why it may be good to have so many cars in the city. Maybe that particular city depends on the automobile industry being strong. And you would have to model that in here. They've already kind of gone in here um, maybe a little bit. I see some economics showing up here. I mean, they talk about how the economic activity of the region corresponds to the cars in the region. But you can imagine feedbacks going out to that as well. Maybe cars in the region correspond to economic activity. But then you have to ask, is that sustainable? So that's going to be sort of the next question we have here is how big do these models need to be? But absolutely, there are interventions that are not currently represented here. And this is just one way to capture what's going on, say, in that London example. But maybe in some other example, we would need to model some other things as well. But the point is we need to sort of zoom out to the point at which we've kind of uh, captured um, all of these tiny little things that you might not think are that important, but when you zoom out enough and include enough of them, you start seeing additional feedbacks. And once you have an additional feedback, additional loops, it's those loops that end up really driving interesting internal dynamics. Without going into the mathematics of it, if there are no loops in a causal loop diagram, there's no calculus in a causal loop diagram. But every time you add a loop, you effectively add um, another whole set of differential equations to a uh, mathematical expression. With every new set of coupled differential equations, you get um, more potential for crazy effects, like these words like chaos that we'll talk about at the end of the semester. So it is the addition of loops to other loops that makes systems so unpredictable, even without events coming in from outside. So that's why we want to make sure we've accounted for all of the loops. And so this is a shift of mind. So this guy, Peter Sands, he wrote this book in 1990. It got a lot of popularity, and it, it got people in strategy thinking that maybe they need to be making this more formal. And so this, the fifth discipline was his idea that feedback systems thinking was something that people, at least back then, weren't paying enough attention to. And you really needed to shift to start thinking more about loops and less about links. And once you started thinking about the loops, then you started recognizing the patterns that made more sense of what was going on here. And so the basic idea is you can think that there's a problem, and that problem has a certain number of variables involved in it, discrepancy, situation, goal. And we have a solution, which is our decision we make and our results. But if we want to shift away from the event-oriented thinking, we have to think about how that action and results changes the situation, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse. And then we have to back up and ask, are there other things that we're leaving out? And sometimes it's OK to leave them out if the, if the size of the effect of these is so small that it just confuses things by including them. And in reality, they don't have that much of an effect. But maybe later on, these other actions and other results become more important, and we have to remember that they're there, kind of in the, in the gray here, and then we can add them back into our system. So, but, uh, but it's this idea that we need to make sure that if there are loops being closed, we definitely, in variables that are on our diagram already, if we don't include all the closures, we're really going to put ourselves in trouble. And then we have to ask, are we being too nearsighted? Are there other variables and other loops that we're leaving out? And is it OK to leave them out? So in the economic example, maybe this is uh, an economic and incentive group. But maybe this is a set of monetary or economic incentives that are not included in that previous London example. And for now, we're leaving them out. We think it's OK. But maybe when we're thinking of potential ways to go about relieving congestion without building more roads, we need to put those back in. So there's a lot of decision making that needs to go on in even building our models. But we need to at least recognize that these models exist. So any questions about this basic idea that we're getting at moving from links to loops. That's what I'm trying to, that's why we have these causal loop diagrams, is they allow us to, we can easily say, uh, justify that a link exists. And by drawing all of the links together, it points out to us that loops exist. And once we see those loops and how they interact with other loops, then we recognize potential frailties in our system. Yeah.
Absolutely. So you can, when you're coming up with these problems in a variable like uh, quality of life, um, if it's you know it's clear that quality is uh, high quality is good and low quality is bad, so it seems like um, and it may be hard to quantify numerically what it means to be quality of life, but we could come up with that later. But for now, we could just say there is some metric for quality of life. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's um, you know infant, mort infant mort mortality, or maybe it's GDP. Come with some metric for that, but in the loop diagram, we can put quality of life in one place and number of cars in the other. And if we could then assert as a theory that if you get more cars, maybe you have more or less quality of life. And um, and who knows if quality of life affects? Like you could say, if people feel better, maybe they buy more cars. So there could be a loop there. You'd have to justify the direction of these loops with uh, either by adding additional variables or coming up with research to say that. Like in a city of this particular size, if you increase the number of cars, generally some metric of productivity goes up. But you might find that in cities of other sizes, you get the opposite relationship. So you have to be careful when drawing these um, the, the polarities of these links, because your polarities might be specialized to a particular type of city. And unless you want to really go out and add a whole bunch of other variables that account for all of these scale dependent effects, you might just keep it a simple model. You might have to then say, no, this is only for a small city. Yeah, that's that's the notion we're getting at. Can you go to the next? So things that um, you can't. So uh, I mean, the simplest thing we'll get to that is like things that don't sound like noun phrases. Things that um, that are difficult to order. So if you could say that um, you know, uh, if you came up with a word where you, it was unclear, like you might be able to say you have a particular attitude, and you have a particular attitude, and you have a particular attitude, and I said, okay, sort everybody by attitude. And then you say, well, I don't really know how to sort that. You need to add another word. Like, you have a, you know, maybe a good attitude, or maybe I need a, a different word, like morale, or um, happiness, you know? And then, then you can start sorting things. So I think if it's a property that is, is sortable, where you can clearly say that someone with this value of property is, somehow on the right side of the screen and somebody with this side of the property is on the left side of the screen, then that's something that you can choose as a variable. But if you can't clearly establish directionality, then it probably can't be used as a variable by itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just thinking that you can't really measure like social class. Well, in my head, that's what I was thinking. Like well, that ancestor well, that's a good question. So in social sciences, often what they're looking for are these so-called proxies for these kind of social things. Like some people, people want you know happiness indices. You say, well, how do you measure happiness? Well, we can't really measure happiness when someone gives index of happiness. And so somebody comes up with a theory that says that um, a mixture of the amount of free time you have, the amount of money you have, uh, you know, you come up with a bunch of these things. And in theory, they think that this might correlate to happiness. And so how would you, you justify that? Then you give people surveys and you ask them how happy do you think you are, okay? Then where uh, do you fit in terms of free time, income, et cetera? And then you go and see, do people who say they're happy, how do they, do we end up coming up with an index that ends up predicting whether they're gonna say if they're happy or not? And if they do, and that's documented in the literature, then I can take those quantifiable things and I can put them into models like this. And then in my model, I can measure the happiness of my simulated people. Um, but then it's taken for granted that I've actually come up with the right model for happiness. But the spirit of it is I would like to generally make sure that people in a city are happier. But, um, so that's why I might initially draw happiness as something in a causal loop diagram. But when the rubber meets the road and I actually have to implement a policy, I might need to unpack happiness and come up with a model of happiness that's based on things that I really can measure. And that model might be bad, but we just have to then evaluate whether it's bad. Okay, so good questions. Um, I think we'll get more of that as we go forward here. So let's just roll through. Um, so CLDs, we already kind of gave the intro to it. Um, same intro from, uh, from Moorcroft. Um, a link is a causal relationship. We put uh, the clarity on the links, which there was a good question on the meeting pulse that I answered on the discussion pages about how do you determine these, especially if you're in situations where maybe in, in certain contexts you'd imagine one link uh, polarity and in other contexts there might be another link polarity. And 
And sort of my answer was, is either in those contexts, you either have to make your diagram more complicated so that you take out that subjective, that, that ambiguity, or you have, to, you have to say, like, this is specifically when I'm in a certain situation, I'm modeling only that case. And algebra, or I say the calculus of it all, is I was saying that choosing a length, if you were to call one of these variables If you were to call one of these variables x and the other variable y, if this was easy to measure, you could come up with a formula for y and a formula for x, that formula for y might involve the variable x in it. And that formula for x might involve the variable y in it. And so these are expressions like you'd see in SOS 2.11. And when we say there's a plus link here, that's equivalent to saying that the derivative of y with respect to x is greater than 0. And so if I gave you a mathematical formulas that somebody had figured out, models like those happiness indices that I just talked about, if I gave you a statistical model um, that represented one of these variables, like a Mount Eaton, happiness or whatever, and inside it, it was written in terms of other variables. Mathematically, if I wanted to figure out whether I draw a plus or a minus here, is I take the derivative of whatever's on the, this side of the arrow with respect to whatever's on the other side of the arrow, and that would give me another formula, and that formula might have x's and y's in it. And then I'd have to ask myself, all right, I'm going to plug in the current x value and the current y value. So I'm interested in the polarity of this arrow, when x is equal to this, when y is equal to this. When my current amount eaten is equal to whatever, uh, you know, 20 grams, and when my hunger is equal to whatever, you know, units I'm using for hunger. In that particular situation, when I evaluate this derivative, if it's positive, then I can put a positive there, but I just need to tell my reader that I'm only drawing this arrow for that particular case when my amount eaten is that and my hunger is that. Now hopefully, and when we draw our diagrams, once you take the derivatives, you'll end up always getting one sign or the other regardless of the context. But that's not always the case. But hopefully, and in the examples that we'll start with, it almost always will be the case, it almost always is the case that the, fun, the, the formula for amount eaten is going to be a simple formula um, related to how hungry you were beforehand, so much that if you were hungrier beforehand, you will probably eat more later. And that's going to be the case regardless of how hungry you are. So we can safely put a plus there. But if we're not quite sure, if we want to try to think back to SOS 211, if you could ask a physiologist or ask an economist to build you a mathematical expression for the thing here in terms of all the other variables, and to build you a mathematical expression for the thing here in terms of all the other variables, then you could just take derivatives like you did in 2.11, and if those derivatives are positive or negative, that's what would tell you whether you put a plus or a minus on these arrows. We're not going to do this that much in this class. We'll maybe have a couple of small examples uh, just, as, just to kind of show that it can be done. But most of our cases, uh, we are going to figure out these things qualitatively just by thinking through the models, but you can do them numerically as well. And that uh, I talked about on the, um, on the discussion page on Canvas here. So those two things are related. So are there questions about that, about choosing these polarities? Just because I know there were questions from last time. Hopefully, after you guys have done the assignment from last time, it's starting to feel a little bit more comfortable about picking these. All right, so then we usually label what type of feedback we get, and that's based on the number of negative links we count around. You might use a B here for balancing, a minus for negative, or a C for counteracting. They all mean the same thing. Question? So, so if the derivative happens to be zero, there would be no problem with not choosing the derivative? Yeah, that's like, right. So think about that. When a derivative is zero, that's equivalent to saying this thing is constant with respect to that. Which, if that's for the case, then maybe you should reevaluate whether there is a link between those. Yeah, good question. 
Any other questions? All right. So when coming up with our links and, uh, and our labels, then we have to keep in mind that links are for causation, not for correlation. So that's one potential caveat to asking an economist for a formula. Economists use a lot of econometrics. It's all statistics. So an economist will tell you there is a relationship between quantity y and quantity x. So then you can ask the economist which causes what. And they'll say, well, that's not really up to me. Like, all I can tell you is there's a relationship. We have to take a stance when we build these models on what we think causes what. And hopefully we build up evidence for that stance. Because we can get it incorrect. We can say that just because the thing on this side of the arrow goes up whenever the thing on this side of the arrow goes down, that there is a causal link that's negative between them. But we might uh, be missing out that there's actually a common cause. And there is no real relationship between these two, except that they're both caused by something, a third thing that we left out of the model. So whenever you draw a link, ask yourself, can I justify how these two things are directly related? And if you can't, then maybe you'd say, well, how might they, I explain that they move in a correlated way? And so I left that, I gave that ice cream example. If I notice that ice cream sales and sunburn both go up, whenever ice cream sales go up, sunburn goes up, I'm tempted to maybe draw a positive link between the two of them. But then I think about it, and how could I justify people aren't getting sunburn from eating ice cream. If I could say that, I would draw the link. But I can't say that. So instead, I say, you know what actually is the sun is out. And so when the sun is out more, people get more sunburn. But when the sun is out more, then it also, um, uh, you know, people, maybe it's hotter, and people then eat more ice cream. And so there is a common cause of the sun being out that causes both of them, and they're not directly related. So make sure to evaluate whether you can justify the link before you draw it. And if you can't, see if you can come up with other variables that explain the correlation that you know is there. So that's the one tip. Are there questions about that? Causation not equaling correlation. All right, so like on a midterm, I might give you a bunch of things and then ask you to evaluate which ones are, the, which one of these links is probably, uh, should be excluded because it doesn't make, you know, causal sense. So then the other, there's all these other tips. So Sturman is uh, sort of when Jay Forrester uh, it, so Sturman kind of took over as now is sort of the boss of system dynamic modeling, and at least in the business side of things. And so uh, over in W.P. Carey, they, you know, they might use this business dynamics book, which is a really expensive textbook that has all the sort of same stuff in it as Moorcroft's book, just in a slightly more detail. And he has these tips for drawing your CLDs. Use curved lines to visualize feedback loops. So when you draw lines in VinSim, they default to straight. Make them curve so you can see the loops. Make sure that the important loops follow circular oval paths so that they're, it's clear that there's a loop there. It's not have a, it doesn't have a weird discontinuity in the middle of it. Um, optimize, uh, organize diagrams to minimize crossed lines. So he has this stuff about chart junk. So he doesn't want boxes to be around your variables. All the variables should be naked and all the lines should, uh, as few lines should cross as possible so that you only see a lot of white space and a lot of lines that don't cross so you can visualize the loops. Because once you have crosses, you might see things that look like loops, but they're really just visual crosses. And then iterate. So um, with added variables, redraw to get the best layout. So you draw two variables and you get a football shape. And then you draw that third variable. Well, that might mean that you need to draw to, to, to drag these things out. Back in the old days when people would just draw these on paper, this would really mean tear up your paper and then redraw their whole CLD. But nicely in, in VinSim, it's pretty easy to add a variable and move everything around. And I haven't shown you it, but VinSim even has a tool where it will try to do this stuff for you. So you draw all your things, you draw your links, and then you say optimize. And it will try to position things so that it kind of abides by these rules. The output sometimes isn't great because it doesn't know the context. You might want to keep certain variables together and other variables together, and it destroys that. But at least it like minimizes cross lines and it makes the loops a little curvier and so on. So those are heuristics that you use to draw these things. The other heuristics that Moorcroft will give you, 
uh, which you said them a chapter, is each variable must be a noun, or I'd say, or a noun phrase. Uh, so you can add adjectives, so this is the noun phrase thing, but there's gotta be a noun in there, so noun and noun phrase. And this imply measurability, which is the same thing I was talking about sorting. So can you sort this variable? If you were to imagine somebody had a different value of this variable, could you put them on the left or right of someone who had a different value? If you can't sort them, it's not clear how two people would compare that different values of this variable, then maybe you chose the wrong variable. So all right, so with that, um, so let's um, pick variables here. So maybe take 30 seconds and talk to your, your neighbor. I've got a set of variables here, and, tr and some of them I think are good variables, and some of them are bad variables, and some of them are eh, not so good. Um, so talk to your neighbor and sort of find the bad thing, the things that probably shouldn't be variables, or find ones you think very strongly should be variables, and then we'll kind of come back together and see what we think. So chat amongst yourself which one of these are good variables and not. All right, let's bring it back in. Does anybody have strong opinions about any one of these words? Um, a very good word that has a causal describer and variable or a, or a very bad word? Deborah? You think so? Okay, why? Um, I'm not going to say yes or no, but so why would you say it's a great, in your opinion? Uh, I think that it's very personal. I said try to use a word, but I'm not sure the definition of the word, so I'm not going to try. Um, I would, well, I'd say, so I, we, we use Markov's word, I think temperature is very measurable, it's a noun, and clearly things are higher, have, can have a higher temperature or a lower temperature. You give me something that's hot and something that's cold, I can say this hot one is hotter than the cold one. I can sort them. So I think temperature, yeah, that seems like a, a good one. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. All right, so let's focus here, increasing prices. So you're saying the increasing kind of makes this one not, a, not such a good one, because why don't you just say prices? And then if pr prices already has got measurability, you can have a high price and a low price. And so, but what does it mean to increase the increase in prices? So yeah, so maybe we get rid of that. So I could go through and maybe I'll just try to add a little answer to the energy increase there. And maybe I'll circle the temperature and maybe circle the prices. All right, uh, so another hand. Yeah. Um, this is morale, it's not falsifiable. So yeah, so morale, that's a tough one, right? So um, morale here, what does high morale or low morale mean? You know, so to, depending on your reader, some people might 
have, uh, you know, it's the, their, their interpretation of the word morale may, like you talk about like, um, you know, a morale officer is, it kind of implies that somebody with high morale might be in a better place than somebody with low morale. But I think oftentimes people would disambiguate morale with an adjective, like maybe good morale or, or something like that. So morale is maybe one that's a little bit harder. It might depend on whether, how do you think your reader will respond to that word? Um, because it, but it is definitely a lot harder to, to quantify than measure or than prices or temperature. Anybody else have a feeling? Get at least one more. Yeah. Can you get more out of happiness by seeing both? Or just like you have the spectrum, just so people can be. So, yeah, the question is about happiness. Um, happiness might also be one that is, might be difficult for somebody to say. Uh, you know, how to quantify happiness. The, the, the good thing about happiness, though, is at least you can say someone's happier or sadder. So we do already have a little bit of a directionality in happiness. Um, whereas uh, mood, um, I mean, you do have a good mood and bad mood, but, but, you know, so I would say happiness is put yourself in less of trouble as you would in morale. But, uh, but still, in, because they're not as quantifiable as temperature, you then you, know, you have to, if you're talking to a very kind of mathematical audience, then certainly happiness is gonna be a hard one to defend. People say, what do you mean by happiness? Or you'd say, well, okay, maybe I mean income, or maybe I mean free time, or something like that. All right, any other ones of these that people identify as they think is a good, bad, or not quite sure? Yeah. Delivery performance, so yeah, I, I kind of like that. The delivery performance here is interesting because um, you can have, somebody can come and deliver something to your house and they can be terrible at that um, or they can be great. And so it's hard to sort of say like, if you get an increase in delivery performance, we might think that means they're better, but it feels like there's probably a better way to say that. I saw another hand, I think. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, if I were to sort of group these, I'd say attitude is worse, <coughs> morale is better, and happiness is best of all three of those. That's why I would do it. But you know, these things are up for interpretation. You, can, you have to defend your model. And in the end, models are for communicating. So a big part of sustainability is communicating your um, views to someone else and trying to fit it into whatever their agendas are so that they can sort of conceptualize it properly. Uh, and so if you have to kind of think about your audience here. The way I kind of grouped these is I was kind of okay with these. So I like um, uh, delivery lead time a lot better than I like delivery performance. This is quantifiable. It's like lead, by lead time, I mean how long does it take for them to get here? Like uh, I ordered the product and 15 days later, they said it was gonna come to my house. It actually came 17 days later, and they were three hours late. So in that case, I can really say that, well, so with a decrease in maybe the number of people that work at a delivery company, their lead time is going to increase, and that will decrease customer satisfaction. So that's why um, you know, I, I, mean, I don't like this, but I like that. Um, increasing prices and attitude, increasing cost, these all came up as probably bad. Um, and then, you know, so under good. I was okay with happiness and morale personally, but I do think morale is on the bubble. I think you have to be careful with that one. Water is, sounds good because it's a noun, but then you think about it, like what does it mean for water to increase? Now in your model, like if you were modeling, uh, I don't know, the amount of water available in Phoenix, then the context of the model makes it pretty clear. You don't have to say the amount of water in the canal or the amount of water in the reservoir. But why don't you say that? Maybe it's actually good to just, if you can, put a few more words on the page, that way nobody is confused. So water itself probably means a little bit more, but maybe based on your model, it's okay to be included. So any questions or thoughts about that? Does anybody you know, have a massive disagreement with, uh, with these categorizations? I'm not saying these are definitely right, 
was saying this is, I think, kind of what I feel like is good. I feel like uh, Moorcroft also kind of grouped these words in his chapter this way. But I can definitely understand that there's some of these with some debate. Yeah. Got it. So the question here was, how do we know that an adjective is directional? An experienced staff seems like it might be a tricky one there, because if you're modeling, let's say, how staff are being trained, then maybe if you want to, um, then you're talking about them increasing in their experience, then maybe there's a way to put this experience into the, the link. And I think um, that, I, it probably depends on the context of the model. I'm picturing a model where experienced staff is like um, the, you know, if you've got, this is like the number of staff who do not need to be trained. So experienced staff are the staff that I can just put out on the floor and they're ready to go. Whereas non-experienced staff need a trainer, need an experienced staff to go along with them. So if you, that's why we often need just an operational definition. So very often, before you put these in here, you'll have before your model, you'll say, and we define experienced staff to be, and then that way you've got those definitions up there. And then you can use the definitions in their short form inside the model here. I saw another hand over here. Yeah. Thanks for this sort of approach of decorating. It makes me think about that. How often do I use these words to describe things that are not necessarily in my Sure, I think this idea of the audience, whether your audience is a legal audience, how, de how detailed your audience needs to be, you have to be very careful about. And you're right, it is subjective, but you have to keep in mind this kind of CLDs are bubbling up through these quantitative models. Ultimately, we're trying to take the insights in our mind from those mental models that have built up over huge amounts. I mean, I understand the way in which that door sounded, it sounded when it closed. I knew, I know so much about that door just by hearing it close. Um, or by hearing that little squeak when it opens. That tells me such a story, but I can't quite put my finger on what information I'm getting from that door. Uh, and so it's, and it ends up being very subjective. And so this is our path to taking that subjectivity that lives up here and turning it into an objective like happiness index that we can put down there. And this is this intermediate path. So we're gonna get stuck in a little bit of that, but so long as we're getting toward objectivity, I think we're making improvement. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, our audience might already have a background, a jargon, and once you have that jargon, jargon actually frees you. It's it's um, it's a little bit like uh, you know writing poetry under in the, the some stage form or whatever. Jargon is not always a bad thing because it establishes a community, and that community can speak in a more nuanced way. But the downside is if anybody's outside your community, they may not be comfortable with lead time. They might even not, you know, if they don't use it that much, they might have said lead time or something like that. So, um, and on top of that, the problem we have is that this textbook that we're using happens to be a book that was primarily written, it was written by Brits, uh, and I think first given out to a British audience. And so we find that there are some just even grammar conventions, and I mean, they don't say things, um, you know, like all flat out, you know, they don't use certain phrases that we don't use over here, but I think you probably t so you can tell as you read the text that they're not quite speaking the same English that we're speaking. Um, and so we do have to be careful about that. And I'm borrowing words from the chapter. I probably wouldn't have said delivery lead time. I might have said something that might have been more descriptive. But I think if you talk to a Brit, then this is probably how they would refer to, you know, how long it took me to get my thing delivered. All right, and an operations research community would also use that term. So. All right, let's move on here. So if you need help picking variables, a nice trick that Moorcroft mentions in this chapter is try defining units. And this is kind of a game, but this goes along with the measurability and the sorting thing, and these might not be real units. 
But so like marketing budget, that's an easy one. That's pounds or dollars per month, right? Or euros or whatever your unit is per month. Sales, units per month. I can define a unit easily. I can talk about that, the things in that unit going up and down. So these are clearly easy to be put in here as, as, um, as variables. Now, industry reputation, that's hard. That's like happiness. But maybe I can imagine that there is some scale, some index of reputation. I'm just arbitrarily going from zero to one, where at zero, you have a bad reputation. Nobody wants to work with you. One, everybody's happy with working with you, doesn't even check your credit. And somewhere in between, you're not quite sure. This is almost like a credit score for a particular industry. And so then I, I can kind of invent an index. I don't know what that index is, but I could imagine that with a little extra research, I could build that index, just like happiness. So I'm okay with putting happiness there. Uh, customers interested, that's easy, customers. Um, bidding power, that's a tough one too. Until I then think about it, and I say, well, you know, bidding power, if I look at how many bids this company has won, then if they won a lot of them, they have a lot of bidding power. Uh, if they haven't won a lot, then they're just never winning these things and they don't have a lot of bidding power. So I've created a unit. And this goes to that operational definition. You can imagine these units, I either define right in my diagram or before I give the diagram, I remind the reader what I'm thinking of in terms of these units and then that helps interpret these things. So that's what I mean by measurability or sortability Unit ability, the ability to define units consistently. And your units might not be the same as my units, but if we agree that we're using my units or your units, we can go on forward with the story. Are there questions about it? Yes? Would there be a gray area on when the bidding power is? Um, well, so I, in this particular case here, I think the, the thought here is if you increase in this particular model, a change in bidding uh, power leads to a change in industry reputation. So the, the thought here is that if you notice that, wow, this company has won a bunch of their bids, once people notice that, then a little bit later, the reputation will go up. So that's kind of the idea there. And so um, you can imagine a larger loop here. You could imagine this company might lower their costs so that they can win more bids. So they're a company that nobody really thinks much of, but they manage to do things cheaper. And when they do things cheaper, they can win more bids. And once they start winning more bids, and maybe you know, there might be other links from like, they're not getting arrested, they're not violating laws, all these those sorts of things. Then after a little bit of time of sustaining that, then they get an increased reputation and people start thinking of them you know, more. And then they start raising their prices. So. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so where do we go next? This is, uh, we've got our causal loop diagram. We, now we're comfortable with how we choose the variables and choose the links. And, uh, and so the next thing when we build from a causal loop diagram is other dynamics. You know, actually how these things behave over time. And so that's kind of what we're stepping into here is you start with a loop like this. And so this is a loop where we, we work through the three variables of interest. We realize that there was a loop we realize that the loop had a delay, and then we see a balancing feedback with a delay, and we know that in the many systems, a balancing feedback with delay generates one of these three different trajectories over time. So if you have water temperature on this axis, time on this axis, then either you, um, you might, you know, the common sense is you're gonna get a slow rise and then it'll end up uh, you know, reaching this, or the most likely, so this is what you think is going to happen, but what actually happens, you get oscillations, way too hot, way too cold, and so on. But if you learn the system enough, then maybe you've adjusted the way you're controlling the water so that you have this ideal case here. So when you get more into this literature, you find out people even name these three modes of behavior. They call this thing critically damped, the ideal one. They call this one, I won't quiz you on this, under damped, and they call this one over damped. And so um, the damp isn't because there's water involved. It's, uh, it's sort of how responsive the control is here. And so we know that the structure of all three systems is identical, but how much delay you have and how responsive you are in your control uh, when you go into actually the flow of the water here changes one of these three shapes. But you know that there's a bunch of shapes that it probably won't be, like the temperature won't rise forever. 
So if it does seem to rise forever, it's probably going to come down and oscillate. So that's where we want to go, is coming from those loops to, uh, to these diagrams here. So this is our first one that we kind of focus on is balancing with delay. It can generate oscillations. It generally it generates things that rise and settle out. And there can be oscillations. And if there's only one of these loops, then those oscillations usually die out. And in the end, all three systems end up coming down to one regulated level. That's kind of, there is a, a one case where this can kind of blow up over time, but we're sort of saying we're not in that case. Most of the time, we end up coming to this ideal temperature. But the question is, um, are we leaving out effects? So if this is our comfort-seeking loop in a hotel room, our hotel room has got a shower in it, and so we know our, how our shower works at home. Maybe we only have one shower at home. But we're in our hotel with hundreds of showers. And so the question is, are there effects of these other showers that might change our behavior over time? So we've got one balancing with delay. And then when we really think about it in this hotel thing here, somebody else in another room that we can't see might be having a shower at the same time. They've got their own balancing with delay. And it turns out that the water is shared between us. So when they turn on their water, then that takes away water from us, meaning that we're going to have to turn on our water more, which will take away water from them. So now not only are we fighting the delay in one shower, but we're fighting with them, fighting with their own delay, and they're fighting with us. So by expanding our view, we end up seeing that there are two loops, actually three loops, that are interacting here, affecting the dynamics. And if we simulate this, which is where we're going in the class, you'll eventually be able to do this on your own, is we can build models of this, and we see that if we can model the two showers under a wide range of conditions, we get trajectories that look like this. The black one is the temperature of one shower, the blue one is the temperature of the other shower. You not only get oscillations, but they grow in both showers over time. If you were to turn off one shower, they would die down and you'd actually hit, hit the temperature that you want, but because they're both fighting each other, then you end up getting these dueling oscillations. And that's because you've got loops interacting. And so we've got interdependent showers here, and you might say, well, why are we studying showers? Well, because we can wrap our minds around showers fighting over a common resource. And if we can build better mental models than we had before by taking what was our mental model of a shower and putting it into a model of a hotel with two showers, then maybe we will update our mental models in a way to give us more insight into, say, the operations of a factory like this Harley-Davidson uh, motorcycle business. And so this is actually uh, a company that Moorcroft did consulting with, and that's what he reports about in this chapter. And what he found out in there is they had uh, two different groups inside the factory, the motorcycle production, but also the group making parts that they sent out to people that dealers and other people doing their own work on the motorcycle. And they had the same capacity management and allocation that they both shared. So if motorcycle production needed more uh, investment, they would end up taking from a pool that was also being used by parts. So orders would come in to both, and both would require resources out of this same pool. And so orders come in, shipments go out, there's a certain lead time on the parts here, and there's this capacity sharing. And so the more capacity that ends up being put over here, the longer lead time you have over here, which is going to cause the parts people to ask for more capacity to be allocated to them, which is going to then lead to a problem with orders over here, and so on and so forth. And so what you actually have here are dueling showers. You have someone sitting over here trying to get access to hot water, but the hot water is coming from the same pipe as someone in the next room trying to get hot water. And so as they're trying to turn on more water, more resource investment here, it's reducing what's available to them, and so they turn on more, which reduces what's available to them. And you end up getting um, this, what looks like a really unpredictable lead time to customers ordering parts. 
And that's what happened when Harley Davidson came to Moorcroft and they said, we don't know what's going on. Sometimes we can get parts out quick and other times we can't get parts out and our customers who are ordering parts are really getting upset. What's the problem? And Moorcroft recognized that they had this bottleneck and that they were dueling between them, which is effectively dynamically the exact same thing that's going on in the dueling showers. So we can use the interdependent showers as a mental model, a conceptual model for other interdependencies. And that's why it's sometimes worthwhile to model a simple system like coupled showers, even though you're not in a shower business, because it might be easier to wrap your head around the showers, and then later you find these relationships which are identical that maybe you didn't see before if you hadn't done the shower model. So there are questions about that. Yeah. That's a good, uh, good point. Um, that you do have two balancing loops here. Um, I think that I think it's fine to think of this as a, mod as a, as a modification of that escalation behavior. There is sort of um, maybe a little, I, I kind of pointed out that there's kind of three loops. There's this, um, there's, that has to do with the delays in getting the resources from here to there. But basically, if there's very little delay there, then yes, this turns into like an escalation behavior. You end up over here, you see the same capacity, but you end up getting this constant fighting back and forth over here. Good, I like that connection. All right. Well, so let's end there on the chapter. We had a lot of good discussion, so we're right at time. Um, looking forward for Sunday, there's a muddiest point coming up. For next week, um, lecture, so our next lecture is lecture C1, that's on Tuesday. And then lecture C2, that's a week from today, that's over this article that I've posted on Canvas, Applying System Archetypes. So between now and next week, read over that article, and it will talk about all these different archetypes, the common archetypes, and how they're used. And so we'll, we'll deal with that in a week. And then uh, on Tuesday, we'll do another in-class assignment similar to the one that we did uh, with uh, Benson. And so with that, uh, I'll do an attendance exercise to keep track of uh, who's here. And um, We'll ask the question. Um, we'll say maybe the question would be, um, yeah, all right, well, that'll be the easy thing. So uh, if I were to draw two variables, x and y, and mathematically I could show that the derivative of y with respect to x was less than zero, then what would I label on this causal link? Plus or minus? So I would say, is this a plus or a minus? So the question is, if I have two variables, x and y, and, and x has a causal relationship with y, and mathematically, the derivative of y with respect to x is less than zero, then what would I put up here, a plus or a minus? Remember, these are just graded for completion, not correctness. Just seeing if you give me an answer that's consistent. So it's just a plus or a minus. Yeah. Yeah.